15 years since your last album. Yep. And um, what, what made you say, I'm, I'm ready for a new album? Did it just come about, or is this something that you'd been thinking about for a long time? Oh, I think about it all the time. But uh, there's this other group that I play in, and we've been on the road basically every year since we got back together in 1994. So it's hard to find the windows of time in between all the Eagles touring. Plus I have three teenagers at home and I, I'm, being a good father is important to me. And so between the Eagles, Eagles and my kids and my charitable endeavors like the Walden Woods Project and the Cattle Lake Institute and all that stuff, doesn't leave me a lot of spare time. But I always have the urge to make a new album and I'm always thinking about it and finally the urge gets so strong after a while. It may take a few years but it builds up and it builds up until I finally say, okay, I have to start an album now. So I call up my, my team, you know, my friend Stan Lynch, and, uh, and we get started. We just find the time somehow. And in this album, you had some collaborators on there, some big names that sang with you. How did you decide who was going to be in this album with you? I called up most of my favorite singers. The people who are on this album with me are people who I consider to be the best in the business. They have the most authentic voices. They sing in tune. Um, they're all good people. Uh, some of them were friends of mine already and some of them I did not know previously. Um, but they are just people that I admire and respect for their talent and for their authenticity. For example, Merle Haggard is about as authentic as you can get, and so is Dolly Parton. So I had some people from that generation, you know, well, Merle, Merle is actually 10 years older than me, and Dolly is about my age. And then I had some younger people from later generations of country singers, but, but all the people are people that I uh, greatly admire and respect as artists and, and as people. Mick Jagger on a country song. Yeah. That's not as strange as it might seem. You know, if you listen to everything that the Stones recorded between 1968 and mid-1972, you hear a lot of country influence in there. You know, during that time, the Stones were immersing themselves in the music of the American South, whether it was country or blues. And in 1968, Keith Richards met a guy named Graham Parsons, who you may know as one of the founders of a seminal country rock group called the Flying Burrito Brothers. It's a whimsical name, but they were really the first alt-country band, you might say, uh, who really started the entire movement. You know, and then there was the Buffalo Springfield and the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, and there was Poco, and then Crosby, Stills and Nash and all that. But uh, Graham Parsons is known as basically the godfather of country rock music. Uh, and of course he's deceased now, but he and Keith Richards were very good friends. And I know that Graham Parsons sat Keith Richards down some nights and said, listen to this, this is, this is a guy named Hank Williams. And this is a guy named George Jones. And this is a guy named Merle Haggard. And this is a woman named Patsy Cline. And I think he schooled Keith Richards in country music. And so the Stones started doing things like Girl with the Far Away Eyes and Honky Tonk Women and, uh, you know, Dead Flowers and, um, um, oh, what's the one, the, 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 um, I can't think of it now. Anyway, the Stones music started to reflect country music, American country music. Um, and Wild Horses, that's the song. And uh, so Mick Jagger made perfect sense to me. Uh, and I wanted, I wanted to mix it up a little bit. You know, I wanted somebody from his generation. I have a great deal of respect for him because of his longevity and how long they've lasted. He's always been very kind to me. I've only crossed paths with him three or four times during my career, and he's always been nothing but supportive and complimentary. Um, so I thought, you know, I'm known as a country rock artist. Miranda Lambert is known as a country artist, and Mick Jagger is known as a rock and roll artist. So I'll put the three together on this wonderful Tift Merritt song, and I'll see what happens. And it worked out fine. Starting the tour tomorrow, uh, you've done this a couple times oh, yeah. in your day. Yeah. 
What goes through your mind? What are you thinking now, the day before the tour starts? Well, I'm thinking a lot about how to, to combine and coordinate my older material with the newer material because it's very different. You know, as I've said in other interviews, I don't live, um, I don't live a monolithic life. I don't, I don't live one kind of life and I don't just play one kind of music. I'm, I'm interested and have always been interested in, in numerous kinds of music. And I don't want to be put into one category or one box. You know, I want to do a lot of different things before I'm through. And I'm fully intending to do a few more albums after this one, and they're going to be very different from this one. Um, so we're working on the set list, and we're trying to integrate these songs into a whole that makes sense to people. You know, and I've got some new people in my band, and we're uh, trying to integrate them. and and just get it all working smoothly and have it make sense. I love playing in this theater, the, the acoustics. You know, musicians always think about the acoustics in the theater and how the theater sounds. And this is one of the better places uh, in the United States to play, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, your voice, you talk about the voices of the collaborators. Your voice has changed over time. What do people hear in your voice today that's different than they would have heard 15 years ago or 30 years ago? And how does that affect your music? Most people tell me my voice hasn't changed over time. Uh, <laughs> and it's, you know, it's a little harder to keep it working than it used to be. You know, I really have to take care of it and work on myself and my, I have to do uh, certain dietary things and I have to avoid alcohol and I have to work out and I have to get enough sleep and I have to have humidifiers in my room and I go to a lot of, I go to great lengths to, to keep my voice working. Um, that's the only difference really. That, I mean some of the songs on this new album I sang in a little bit different style because they were country songs and I sang them in a lower key than I normally would but other than that uh, things with my voice um, I mean I read a lot of comments and I hear a lot of people say you know your voice hasn't changed in, in 42 years um, but it's it is it is more of a struggle to keep it working properly the Eagles were a rock and roll band with a a, a, a decisive country sound yeah. to them. This is a country album. I listened to the album today for the most part. Yeah, there's some debate about that too. But, uh, so but, yeah. set me straight. <laughs> what, what, what made this transition and, and why does this sound interest you today? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you this. There, there is definitely a lot of country influenced music on this album, okay? But uh, that's not the only thing on it. There, we have this new category now that they call Americana. You know, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is. It's sort of a combination of country and folk and singer-songwriter stuff. And so there are some songs on this album. Uh, I just got a Lifetime Achievement Award, as a matter of fact, from the Americana Music Association. I went to Nashville and, and was, was honored to be presented with that award by Rodney Crowell, who is a, a friend of mine and somebody I respect a great deal. Um, there's some Americana artists on my album, um, you know, um, um, Lucinda Williams for one, and uh, Alison Krauss, you might call an Americana artist. Uh, there are a couple of blues songs on this album. There's a song called Too Much Pride that's a blues song. Um, there's a song called Take a Picture of This that is more like the stuff that I might have done in the 80s and 90s, kind of a more of a rock song. So this album is kind of all over the map. You know, in this country, in our culture, we like to put things in little boxes. You know, this goes in this category and this goes in this little box over here. And I, I really don't want to, to be in a little box. I want to be free to do, again, all kinds of music. I mean, people ask me what I listen to every day. First of all, I don't listen to music every day. <laughs> Sometimes you just want silence, you know. But when I'm at home, I listen from, from, to everything from Chopin to Ravel to George Jones, to James Brown, to the Beatles, to, you know, it's, it's a wide array of, of music that I listen to. And that's the way I grew up. 
listening to a lot of different kinds of music. A lot of the influence from this album came from all the radio stations I listened to as a kid. You know, I lived in a geographic location in the northeastern corner of Texas where we were able, simply because of where we were, to pick up a lot of different radio stations. Those big, they were called 50,000 watt super yeah. stations in those days, they were AM stations. And I could get a station out of Nashville called WLAC that was a famous station that had a DJ who called himself John R. And everybody thought he was black, but he was white. And he played rhythm and blues music, wonderful rhythm and blues music. Uh, there was a station in New Orleans called WNOE. And as you know, New Orleans is its own musical planet. And I heard things on that station that you didn't hear anywhere else at all. Just music that was indigenous to New Orleans. I heard a radio station in Oklahoma called KOMA. I heard a radio station out of Dallas called uh, KLIF. I p was able to pick up a radio station uh, just that broadcast from just across the Mexican border in Del Rio, Texas with a crazy DJ called Wolfman Jack who played all kinds of stuff. Um, so I had a rich musical upbringing because the place I lived in was a cultural crossroads. It was where the Old South meets the West. And there was blues music, gospel music, bluegrass music, western swing, um, you know, you name it, we had it. And my parents, we were fortunate enough to have enough money, we, they, they bought us a record player. When I was a young kid I had a 45 RPM RCA record player with the red top spindle on it. And my mom would once in a while go to a larger, we couldn't get records in my hometown, so she would go to a larger town and she would buy records. And um, the first 45 rock and roll record she bought me was Hound Dog by Elvis Presley. Um, my father was a veteran of World War II, so later on in the early 60s they bought a console model record player that played 33 and a third RPM records. And they would buy big band records, you know, people like uh, Glenn Miller and the Dorsey Brothers and Gene Krupa and you know Guy Lombardo and that big band music like so you know and my grandfather had a big old wooden radio and he would listen to fiddle music and bluegrass music my grandmother lived with us she sat around in a rocking chair singing hymns and Stephen Foster songs so I had a rich varied musical upbringing and I'm grateful for that because it's it's served me well you know one of the reasons the Beatles were popular was their versatility you know, they did all kinds of music and they were influenced by all kinds of music. You know, in Eleanor Rigby you can hear classical music. And yesterday you can hear classical music. You know, they did country music. Uh, they did it all. And that's one reason they, they were so popular and they lasted so long. So, um, I think that works to my advantage, I hope so at least. So, um, I love all kinds of music if it's good. You know, there was a famous and controversial jazz drummer named Buddy Rich. And Buddy Rich said, there are only two kinds of music, good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree with him. And you play the good music. I hope so. Uh, we're in Arizona, and there is a small town in Arizona that the Eagles and you made famous. Yes, Did you have any idea what impact you guys would have on Winslow, Arizona. And do you think about Winslow, Arizona? No, well, Jackson Brown deserves a lot of credit for that as well because he wrote a lot of that song. Um, I do feel a kinship with Winslow, Arizona because Winslow is going through, or has been going through the same thing that my little hometown in Texas has gone through, which is they built a bypass around the town. You know, when, when when trucking became a big industry in post-war America, they built bypasses around most of these towns. Traffic used to come right through town, you know, and people would stop and they would shop and buy things. And then the highway department, transportation department, built bypasses around all the towns so the cars don't come through there anymore. So a lot of little towns started to dry up. And I know that that happened to Winslow and it certainly happened to my hometown. Um, so I'm glad that our music was able to help them, you know, build a tourist attraction of some sort. I, 
I know all about it as people send me photographs from all over the place, you know, people standing by the statue and stuff. But, but Glenn Fry and Jackson Brown wrote that song and they deserve the credit for that. Great, we really appreciate your time. Okay. That was great. If, if you have, a, if you have way, a, two more I, minutes, I've got two more questions. I, okay, I have two more minutes and, okay. I, and I want to add something too. Okay, this album really seems to get to the heart of working people who it, it sounds like have had a rough time. I mean, are you speaking to the post-recession yeah. hard-working Americans? My father grew up on a corn and cotton farm in Northeast Texas in, in Hopkins County. And during the, le during the years leading up to the Great Depression, things got so bad that my dad had to drop out of school after he finished the eighth grade and go home and work in the field with his brother and his, and his dad, my grandfather. So he came up in tough times and he lived through the Great Depression. He was in World War I and my mother, of course, lived through the Great Depression as well. So I come from a blue collar, working class family. Most of my ancestors were farmers and I inherited my work ethic from them. And I'm proud of my heritage. You know, I'm proud of coming from working class people. And this album reflects what it's like to live in a small town that's fading um, and, and how hard it is. You know, this is a, an acknowledgement and a nod to my hometown and to all small towns across America. It's not just my hometown that's having a, good, a hard time. A, a, a good many towns across America are having the same kind of tough time right now. Middle class is disappearing. The middle ground is disappearing. In politics, you know, we're, we're a nation of extremes now. Either you're way over here or you're way over there. Aristotle, who was one of the greatest philosophers all of all time, said that reason and honor and good sense are in the middle, you know. That's where, that's where the answers are, in the middle, not way over here and not way over there. And I can't remember a time when this country was more divided except maybe during the Civil War. And people ought to sit down in front of their TV sets sometime and watch Ken Burns' incredible documentary about the Civil War just to remind themselves of what can happen when a country becomes so divided. Uh, but yeah, I come from small town working class America, and I'm proud of that. And this album is a tribute to those people. Your song with Martina McBride, getting back to voices, it really sounded to me like your voice and her voice were a perfect complement to each other. Did you hear that? And what, what do you make of that sound? I loved singing with her. She's, she grew up, you know, she's, she's from the middle of the country, grew up doing what I did, playing in clubs, playing with bands, being in a cover band, you know, she came up, she came up the slow way like we all used to do before all these TV shows that make you famous in five minutes. Uh, so she did some dues paying, I have a lot of respect for her. It was a joy singing with her, it was a joy singing with Dolly Parton, who is real as it gets, you know. She is a true American treasure, just as authentic and real as she can be. So I enjoyed, that was the most fun part of making this album is having all these wonderful singers come down to the studio and sing on it. Is there any specific reason you kicked off the tour in Arizona? Nah, it's just where they sent me. <laughs> it just uh, worked out? Yeah. You know, there's no rhyme or reason to that. But I am, I am proud and happy to see her today and tell you that I just found out that my album is going to enter the national charts next week at number one. Congratulations. Thank you. Fantastic. And, and for a 68-year-old guy, that's quite a feat. And I owe a great debt of thanks to a lot of people for that, you know, to Capitol Records and to my management team and to my band and to all the wonderful people who participated in, in this album, all the people we've been talking about that came that were gracious enough to come down and sing on it and play on it. And so I'm just kind of stunned <laughs> and, and delighted at the same time. Well, if you've heard the album, you shouldn't be stunned. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, thank you. All right.